So the assumptions, n1 times p1, p1 is the proportion with the first sample, um, times 1 minus p1 has to be greater than or equal to 10, and the same applies for uh, n1, p1 greater than or equal to 10, the same condition for the second sample. Of course, the samples have to be independent, Population distribution is normal, that is no skew. That's all we're trying to say, that the data that you collect from the population has no skew, or the population doesn't have any skew whatsoever. So, the proportion of students who like Disney when growing up in Florida I'll call that P1. It's claimed to be greater than the proportion of students who like Disney while growing up in California, of course. I'll call that P2. And to verify that claim, uh, we collect two independent samples, and uh, the assumption should hold up but even if it doesn't, for the sake of the problem, I'm going to assume that it uh, holds up. Uh, the number of students from California who liked uh, Disney is 74 out of a sample of 121, whereas the number of students from Florida who liked Disney while growing up is 181 out of 254. We'd like to verify the claim using alpha equals 0.05. Okay, so what is the hypothesis? We have the normal and we have the alternative. P1, according to the problem, is Florida, and P2 is California. So the claim is P1 greater than P2. What is the null? P1 is less than or equal to P2. You can also write it as P1 equal to P2. If I move that P2 to the other side, I have P1 minus P2 less than or equal to zero. Same. What does that zero signify? Last time it was mu naught or mu sub zero. Here it is p sub zero or p naught. p naught is simply the value that we assume under the null. And since we are saying that the there, that since we are comparing the two differences, that null value is zero. Alpha is 0.05, in other words, the probability of type 1 error. Under the null is 0.05. Type 1 error is nothing but false positive. Third step is to look at the data. So we have information from Florida, and we have information from California. The total number that was that was sampled in the state of Florida is two hundred and 
54. So M1 is 254. The total number that was sampled in California is M2. And that is 121. 121. So out of those 254, how many of, of the students said that they liked Disney? 186. So 181. Out of the 121 students that we sampled from California, 74 said that they liked Disney while growing up. So we have the sample information. We want to know what proportion of those 2,254 students liked Disney. In other words, we would like to find P1 hat. And likewise, for California, we would like to find P2 hat. So P1 hat, how do we find P1 hat? X1 over M1. X1 over M1, good. And what is that answer? 0 0.71. 0 0.71. In a similar manner, P2 hat X2 over N2. So, 0.61. 0.61. Clearly, the proportion for Florida seems to be greater than the proportion for California. Yes? So, should we just stop here? No. Even though they are different mathematically, we would like to know if they are statistically different. In other words, if the conclusion that we see here is it significant from a statistical standpoint for us to conclude that the claim or, or we found evidence toward the claim. So we have to perform the test. What are the things that we need for the test? The most important thing that we need to get from the data. Degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom. Okay. Something else. Uh, that comes later. From the data. From the data. S2 squared? SP squared. S SP squared. What did she say? SP squared. SP squared. Pull standard, uh, pull very. No. Before that, well, using pulled variance, we found something else. Two words. First one starts with T, second starts with S. Okay, test statistic. We need to find the test statistic. It is the most important thing that we need to get from the data. So, um, what is your name? Anna. Anna. There is no standard deviation here, right? So, we're not going to look at full standard deviation or full variance, but we are going to look at something called the full proportion. So, The pooled proportion P hat is simply x1 plus x2 divided by n1 plus n2. 
In this case, it would be 165 divided by 375. And what is that copy? We stop with two decimals so that we leave it at two decimals. But I believe in this case it should be exactly 0.68. Okay, just like the pooled variance, and I mentioned all the pooled standard deviation. When we did that problem the last two times, the pooled standard deviation has to lie between S1 and S2, right? In a similar manner, this pooled proportion has to lie between P1 hat and P2 hat, or else you did something wrong. Does 0.68 lie between 0.71 and 0.61? Yes. Okay. Okay, what do we get here? Zero point zero two four. What did we have last time? Okay. So how do we find the test statistic? We simply take that numerator of point one, divide by the standard error. So S And what do we get? Two point something. Four point something. One point seven. One point seven. And what were the two methods that we used last time? One is the critical value approach, the other is the p-value approach. None of the process would change. The only thing would change would be the values that we got because the test statistic changed a bit. It changed from whatever value we had last time to 1.94 this time. So the critical value method. Do you believe that the critical value that we had last time would change? No, because alpha is the same, so the critical value is not going to change. And how did we find the critical value? We used inverse norm. And what is the area over there? Well, that is below. What's about? 0.05. And that is our rejection region when you plug it in the calculator. You 
should get 1.645. Right? And mass norm 0.95 would get you 1.645. Now, why does the test statistic for 1.645 is over here? The test statistic that we got is 1.94. Where does it fall? Right here. Does the test statistic fall in the rejection region? Yes. Should we reject the no? If we rejected the null, what could we say about the conclusion is the proportion of students who like Disney growing up in Florida greater than the proportion of students who like Disney growing up in California? That's our claim, right? We rejected the null, so we found support toward the alternative. So our conclusion is in fact B1 greater than B2. Good. This is a right tail test. So the p-value is simply the area above bank. That's the statistic. And what function do we use to find the p-value using your calculator. To find the critical value, we use inverse norm. To find the p-value, we should use normal CDF. Normal CDF. The test statistic is 1.94. And we would like to find that area, and that area is simply the p value. Don't confuse that area with alpha. So the p value is the area above the distant distance. So even before we start the problem or plug it in the calculator, the area for alpha is 0.05, which is shaded in red. The area above the test statistic is shaded in black. So would we expect that value to be less than 0.05 or greater than 0.05? Less than 0.05. So normal CDF, where does um, the area start? It starts at 1.94. Where does it end? E99. Mean is zero and standard deviation is one. Plug in that and tell me what you get.
Did they round that six? That's the one after it. So six one? Right. We'll keep four decimals because it's a probability. Is that p value less than the alpha that we chose? Alpha is 0.05, p value is 0.0261. We reject the null and can Conclusion is exactly the same as what we had here, which is B1 is greater than B2. Good. We put in the value of X1, which is 181. N1 is 254, X2 is 74, N2 is 121, and we selected the last case, which is greater than P2, and we hit calculate. And that's when everything went south, but today, everything's fine, right? The value for test statistic is 1.96. Still, our value over there is 1.94. This is 1.96, which is more accurate. That's what it is. This. Um, the p-value that we had is 0 0.0261, slightly different from the value we have here because of rounding. We rounded p1 half to 0.71, B2 half to 0.61. So given all that, it's natural for us to, for us to expect the test statistic and the p-value to be slightly off. Are we clear? Any questions? So on an exam for the homework assignment, if X1, N1, X2, N2, um, if they're all given, Go with the calculator first, so you would know the answer right away. Um, but if those aren't given, then you have to know this formula, but you can put it in your cheat sheet to find the test of this. Are we clear? Okay, we'll do one more problem on this, and if we have time, we can move on to the next section. So our objective here is to compare, well it is claimed that the proportion of off-campus students who like tea is claimed to be not the same as the proportion of on-campus students who like tea. We collected a sample, two of them, clearly off-campus, on-campus, they are independent samples. I right. designed the problem in such a way that the assumptions are satisfied. Um, 34 out of the 74 off campus students indicated they like tea, and 27 out of the 110 um, on campus students in indicated that they like tea. So P1, P2, P1 off campus, P2 on campus. Um, I want you to fill steps 1, 2, and 3 for me. So, the claim is that the proportion of all campus students who like tea is not the same as the proportion of on campus students who like tea. So, what is the null? Oh, let's start with the alternative. What is the alternative? P1 not equal to P2. We can also write this as P1 minus P2 
not say quartz, it's zero. But it sort of tells us the null value, and the null value in this case is simply zero. What what is the null? The value of alpha is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 would simply imply the probability of a type 1 error under the null that we are willing to tolerate is 10%, which is too much, do you agree? So typically we don't go for 10%. I did it for the sake of the problem so that you can understand things better. So, what is X1 for off campus students? 74. How many students did we sample? No, it's 30 and around. Oh, 34, 74. Sorry. And P1 hat is the sample proportion for off campus students. And that would simply be 34 divided by 74. And what do we get? 0.46. And x2 in this case is 20 of oh, 10. No, 110. So N2 is 110. 27 out of 110 responded that they like T. So P2 hat is 27 over 110. 0 0.25. Now, just by looking at them, they're not the same, right? 0.46, 0 0.25, they seem to be different. Our objective now is, are they different from a statistical exam point? That's it. And why do we have to worry about it? The concept being, well, if I went and collected a different sample, perhaps I might get a different conclusion but if we could statistically validate it, we're putting an error and saying, well, the chances of that happening could be quantified by the p-value, so we could be comfortable in making a conclusion. So, what is p1 hat minus p2 hat? It is 0.46. Minus 0.25, minus 0, it is the same, and this would be 0.21. In order to find the standard error, we need to find the fourth proportion. What formula did we use last time to find the fourth proportion? x1 plus x2 over n1 plus n2. And how did we verify, or how could we verify, that uh, if we computed p hat correctly? If it's between uh, p hat and p1 hat. So whatever answer that we find has to lie between 0.46 and 0.25. If it doesn't, we made a mistake. Let's see. X1 is 34, X2 is 27, to 1 over 184, and that is 0.3. Oh, two should be fine, because we are approximating anyways. Point three three. Point three three.
So the test statistic in this case would simply be 0.21 divided by 0.0707, which is 2.971. So the test statistic is 2.971. Critical value method, last time the rejection region was on the right hand side. This is a two-tailed test, so where should the rejection region be? Both sides. sides. So we have to find the critical values. There is one on the right hand side, there is one on the left hand side. The notation is Z sub alpha. Alpha in this case is 0.1, Z sub 0.1. And on the right hand side it is Z sub 1 minus alpha, and that would be um, Z sub 0.9. Does it matter that we find both of them? No. Um, oh, I forgot. Alpha over 2. Can someone tell me why we have to divide it by 2? Because it's a two tailed test. So 0 0.05 and 0 0.95. What do we get? We already know the answer from the previous talk. Right? 1.645. If that is 1.645, what is this? Negative 1.645. So, those are the critical values. And our test statistic happens to be 2.971. Where does it fall? Here. Where is the part of the projection region? Probably somewhere there. Right. So, does the test statistic fall in the rejection region? Yes. Which would imply that we reject the norm. which would imply P1 is greater than P2. The proportion of um, off-campus students who like T is greater than the proportion of on-campus students who like T. Good?
regardless of what method you do, the conclusion has to be the same. The way we interpret each of the numbers, slightly different, but the conclusion must be the same. So, last time we did a right tail test and we said that the p-value is the area above the test statistic. In this case, it should be Above the test statistic. Two times the area above the absolute value Easier way to remember this, two-tailed, which means the p-value must have two somewhere. Uh, that is a good way to remember. So the test statistic is actually positive to begin with, and it happens to be 2.97. And if I take the absolute value of the test statistic, it still is going to be 2.97. And that is what we need to find. So that's half of p value, not p value itself. Mind you, we have to multiply that by two over here. So that's just half of p value. How do we find that number? What function do we use that calculator? Normal CDF. Normal CDF. So two times. Where should we start? We start at 2.971. What is the upper boundary? E99. E99. What is the mean? Standard deviation. And what do we get? Is that less than alpha? Yes, it's point 0.1. Um, clearly, it's less than alpha. So, we still reject the null. We end up getting the same conclusion. But the interpretation is different. How do we interpret it here? If I rejected the null, which is the case, we rejected the null, based on the current evidence, um, the probability that I would make the wrong decision, or I made the wrong decision, is 0.3%. So do you think that probability is high or tiny? It's tiny. So in concluding P1 is greater than P2, under the null and based on the evidence that I see, the chances that I made a mistake is only about 0.3%. So in a reasonable sense, I can comfortably reject it. 